Hello and welcome to the class 10 video. This is going to be a shorter video because most of class 10 is taken up with the test. The test is meant to last 50 minutes and the in-person version of the class lasts 75 minutes, so we've got some space here. I included this reading not just because Baldwin is one of the great writers of the 20th century, but, he provi but because he provides a needed perspective given the way this class is structured. Because this class is structured around Desmond's book, it is mostly about seeing poor communities um, through the eyes of an outsider. Desmond does a good job of keeping himself out of the picture and presenting people in their own words, but he's not an insider to these spaces. So Baldwin is here to give us um, the perspective of an insider. Um, and the exercise I had you do emphasized this by having you compare the neighborhoods being discussed while contrasting the writers. Uh, so you should have come up with your own answers to those questions. Uh, and in this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I see these questions. So first, some background. Baldwin was born in Harlem during the 1920s. Uh, Harlem had been a destination site for the first wave uh, of what's called the Great Migration, uh, the migration of African Americans out of the South over the course of the 20th century. When blacks arrived in New York, various segregation rules meant that they mostly had to settle in one poor neighborhood on the north end of Manhattan. And this densely packed neighborhood became the center of a cultural flowering known as the Harlem Renaissance. So Baldwin was a child in Harlem at this time, and he grew up in this intensely uh, intellectual environment. So he lived in Paris for about 10 years, during which time he wrote his first successful books, including Giovanni's Room, which, deal, which deals with themes of homosexuality and queer spaces, and Alienation. Baldwin is best known, though, for his writing on the civil rights movement when he returned to America in the 60s and 70s, including his great book, The Fire Next Time, which was published in 1963. So right now there's a bit of a contemporary Baldwin revival. His 1974 novel, If Beale Street Could uh, Talk, was made into an Academy Award winning movie in 2018. And a documentary about him, uh, I Am Not Your Negro, was nominated for an Academy Award. So this bit from um, Toni Morrison's uh, uh, eulogy for James Baldwin, I think, gives a sense of his role in um, the intellectual history of uh, American writing in the 20th century. I'm just going to read it. You can read it, too. Uh, you gave me a language to dwell in, a gift so perfect it seems my own invention. I have been thinking about your spoken and written thoughts for so long I believed they were mine. I have been seeing the world through your eyes for so long and believed that clear, clear view was my own. I believe that clear, clear view was my own. Even now, even here, I need you to tell me what I am feeling and how to articulate it. So I have poured again through your 2,895 pages of published work to acknowledge the debt and to thank you for your credit. No one possessed or inhabited the language for me the way you did. You made American English honest, um, genuinely international. You exposed its secrets, reshaped it until it was a truly modern, dialogic, representative until it was truly modern, dialogic, representative, and humane. So, yeah, Baldwin. I think it's important to read some Baldwin while you're in college. So let's talk about this essay itself, Fifth Avenue Uptown. It was published in 1960 with pictures by Saul, photographs by Saul Leiter. It describes Baldwin's reaction to returning to the neighborhood he grew up in after a decade away in Paris. He describes the neighborhood as being worn down. He talks about people who have moved away. The pull quote here, I think, describes the, uh, the effect that he's seen on his neighborhood 
uh, the effect that white America has had on his neighborhood. And he says, there are few things under heaven more unnerving than the silent accumulating contempt and hatred of a people. So, I mean, Baldwin is quick to admit that there are poor white neighborhoods too, but he says, an itemized account of American failure should not console uh, does not console me and should not console anyone else. He also admits that some black people have escaped the ghetto and done well, but he is not impressed by this. Not all of these people, it is worth remembering, left the world better than they found it. The determined will is rare, but it is not invariably benevolent. So how does Baldwin's neighborhood compare with the neighborhood in Evicted? The obvious similarities is that both neighborhoods are poor, and when it comes to Sharina's neighborhood, the, the Sharina's tenants, both neighborhoods are black. A less obvious uh, point is that in each case, residents are legally and economically trapped in their neighborhood. In July of 1960, when this essay was published, the residents of Harlem were legally prevented to, um, from moving um, to other neighborhoods by redlining and racially restrictive covenants. Both of these practices are illegal now, but the residents of Mil the Milwaukee neighborhoods Desmond describes are still trapped in their neighborhoods by various forms of tenant screening, including te screening tenants for criminal records, a history of eviction, and for receiving public assistance. Another similarity that Baldwin mentions in passing is that the residents of both neighborhoods get sucked into exploitive economic deals because they lack bargaining power. We've already talked about things like Tobin Charney's handyman special and the trap of owning a trailer home, but not the land uh, that sits on it, that it, that it sits on which is one of the ways poor people uh, get taken advantage of because they uh, lack bargaining power. The issue of exploitation also comes up in Baldwin's famous line, anyone who has ever struggled with poverty knows how extremely expensive it is to be poor. And if one is a member of a captive population, economically speaking, one's feet have been placed on the treadmill forever. Um, we will go on to discuss what he's talking about here when we read an article called The Privilege of Buying 36 Rolls of Toilet Paper at Once and all the various ways in which poor people wind up having to pay more for the same things that rich people buy. So what about differences? The obvious difference is that Baldwin is a black man writing about his own neighborhood and he includes himself in the story, whereas um, Desmond systematically erases his own presence. Another uh, difference that many people note when reading this, many of my students note, um, is that Baldwin is very, very angry. Baldwin also writes with enormous compassion, but sometimes people aren't always able to see the compassion uh, th for the fact that Baldwin is seething with rage. So here are some passages from the essay. Um, the projects in the Harlem are hated. They are hated almost as much as the policemen, which is saying a great deal. And they are hated for the same reason. Both invariably reveal the real attitude of the white world. No matter how many liberal speeches are made, no, no matter how many lofty editorials are written, no matter how many civil rights commissions are set up, right? Uh, and then later, the projects are hideous, of course, there being a law apparently respected throughout the world that popular housing should be as cheerless as a prison. Even, the administration of the, even if the administration of the projects was not so insanely humiliating, for example, one must report raises in salary to the management, which will then eat up the profit by raising one's rent. The management has the right to know who is staying in your apartment. The management can ask you to leave all at their discretion. The projects would still be hated because they are an insult to the meanest intelligence. So I've just highlighted some of the words in red here that um, I think capture, uh, capture 
the overall affect that Baldwin is um, sending the reader. Hate, hated, real attitude of the white world, hideous, humiliating insult. Um, so here's another bit. None of Commissioner Kennedy's policemen, even the best in the world, have any way of understanding the lives lived by the people they swagger about in twos and threes controlling. Their, their presence is an insult, and it would be even if they spent the entire day feeding gumdrops to children. And then a little bit later, he talks about the policeman, and he says, he has never himself done anything to be hated. Which of us has? And yet he is facing daily and nightly the people who would gladly see him dead, and he knows it. So I'm, actually, I have a little, I sometimes wonder how to put these two paragraphs together. Uh, how can Baldwin say the policeman has never done anything uh, for which to be hated? Didn't he just earlier say that, um, you know, uh, neighborhoods uh, have witnessed the policeman's incompetence, injustice, and brutality? Well, I think the biggest reason for Baldwin's response here is that the policeman is no more responsible for the situation he's in than a soldier is for starting the war he is fighting. So there's a double meaning in the next passage uh, comparing a police to an occupying army. It doesn't just emphasize that there are two Americas, one black and one white. It shows that the policeman, like the foot soldier, is really a pawn in a lar much larger game. Um, so, uh, so the passage, um, oh, actually that's not the, the occupying army passage isn't on this slide, but it's there. And another thing that's worth noting is that the year after this was published, Kennedy first authorized the use of napalm in Vietnam. A third difference that you may not have read far enough in Evicted to see is that Desmond is more optimistic about the possibility of change. He writes about the times in history when tenants have recognized their common interest and banded together to block evictions and organize rent strikes. Desmond sees no such class consciousness now, but he clearly believes he, it can return. Baldwin has no such optimism. He sees things like buy black campaigns as futile uh, and um, more about creating solidarity in bitterness than um, helping keep people alive. Yeah. So those are uh, some of the contrasts and comparisons that I see. Um, James Baldwin died of stomach cancer in France in 1987 and is buried near New York City.